So um, this talk, I think, is going to be slightly different from the talks that we've been having so far, uh, in the sense that what I'm particularly interested in is the role that imagination can play in the epistemology of modality, so our knowledge of possibility and necessity claims. Um, and sort of in the process of evaluating <coughs> whether or not imagination can play a role in the epistemology of modality, um, I've been sort of doing this sub-project at looking at different aspects or different interpretations of what imagination might be, and then for each of them try to evaluate whether or not um, it can play a role in the epistemology of modality. And so the talk, the talk of today is going to focus on what I call pretense imagination, uh, which very roughly is sort of imagination as hypothetical belief or vision. Um, so just to sort of set up the picture a little bit, let me give you a very crude history or overview of sort of the, the role that imagination is supposed to play in the epistemology of modality. And then what I'm particularly interested in are these non-actual possibilities, right? So it's actually the case that we're having this conference online, um, but I take it that it's also a true non-actual possibility that we would have this conference in person. Um, so the question is, how do we know that that's the case, that it's possible that we could have this conference in person? And many have suggested that some kind of imagination there plays a role, right? So the intuition is something like, I can imagine that this conference is being held in person, that it must be possible that um, this conference can be held in person. Um, but then, of course, there's these annoying a posteriori necessities that Kripke showed. Um, and the worry is that if there are things that can be necessary but require empirical investigation before we can find out whether or not they're necessary, it seems that before we perform the, the necessary or the relevant empirical investigations, um, it seems that we can imagine the negation of these necessities. Right? So take the, the very famous example of Hesperus being identical to phosphorus. It seems that before we did the relevant cosmological um, discovery, we could easily imagine Hesperus being distinct from phosphorus. Um, but if that's true, then it seems that we can imagine impossibilities as well. And then the question is, if we can imagine these impossibilities, how can imagination then play a role in the uh, epistemology of possibility? Um, so, apart from moving on, sort of away from imagination completely, there are sort of two main responses to these uh, a posteriori necessities uh, in relation to the role that imagination might play in the epistemology of modality. So the first one is um, what Peter Kuhn described as an error theory of imagination, and people have argued that Kripke himself sort of defended something like this. And very roughly, the idea is something like, you think you're imagining uh, an impossibility, but really you're mistaken about what you're imagining. You are in fact imagining something that's possible, um, which is just sort of a qualitatively uh, similar possibility to what you're thinking is an, uh, an impossibility. So um, many people have argued amongst uh, others, Peter Kung and uh, Chris from Wright, that this doesn't really seem to sort of work. Um, it seems very implausible that we're mistaken about what we're imagining uh, and Chris from Wright argued that even if you think that we could be mistaken um, about certain classes of a posteriori necessities, there's also classes of a posteriori necessities about which it seems very weird to say that we would be mistaken because they're sort of a first person perspective imaginings. So the other option would be then to say, let's sort of restrict imagination and look at a subclass of imaginings or let's look at a particular type of imagination that can play a role in the epistemology of uh, modality in the sense that it sort of gets the a posteriori necessities just right, which sort of has become a desideratum in the, the imagination-based epistemologies of modality ever since Kripke. So um, again, there's roughly two ways in which people have spelled out this kind of restricting of the imagination. The first one is what you might call concrete imagination. Um, this is where you think that imagination just sort of builds up this hypothetical situation, a concrete situation, which is then supposed to represent a possibility. And the idea is that out of all these situations that you can construct in imagination, we just look at a particular subset, uh, which then corresponds to possibilities. And then these 
sort of the imaginings in the subset are supposed to be a guide to what's possible. So people like Peter Kung and Daniel Dorn have tried to sort of uh, defend positions of this kind. But I take it that um, arguments from, for example, Magdalena Belder Jackson uh, were very forceful in suggesting that this doesn't work. Um, I myself have also in other work argued that um, these kinds of restrictions don't really work and that they seem to rely on prior modal knowledge. So then the second suggestion, which has sort of come up more recently and uh, for which Magdalena Baldrick Jackson has argued very forcefully, is that we can look at imagination as a sort of recreative capacity. And the idea is that uh, imagination sort of recreates or simulates other cognitive capacities that we have uh, without the necessary sort of uh, input from the external world or sort of the behavioral outputs. Um, and then this is where I think it becomes interesting that we can pull apart the different kinds of cognitive mechanisms that you might take imagination to sort of recreate, right? So for example, people like Dominic Gregory and Magdalena Balter Jackson really focus on imagination recreating these sort of perceptual experiences, which you might call uh, the appearance-based recreative imagination. But what I'm gonna focus on is this aspect of simulated believer vision. So um, earlier views such as Nicholson Stitch, uh, perhaps also Curie and Ravenscroft's work um, mentioned this relatively explicitly. Also Peter Langland Hassan in his work on pretense seems to suggest that pretense is very closely related to hypothetical belief revision. Um, and what I find most interesting is for example, people like Timothy Williamson, uh, who aren't very clear on what they take imagination to be, where arguably it is uh, kind of the simulated belief revision that also plays a crucial part in what they take imagination to be, even though they don't spell it out that explicitly. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is just this sort of subsection of what you might take imagination to be, the simulated belief revision. And I'm not claiming that this is what imagination is or that this is the best way to understand um, what imagination is. I'm just claiming that uh, this is a way to understand what imagination is or it is a aspect of imagination. I'm just going to evaluate that particular aspect for its potential role in the epistemology of possibility. So the plan for the rest of the talk is to give a very general view uh, and theory of what I call pretense imagination. So the imagination as a simulated belief revision. And then uh, afterwards, I'll present a logical framework that's supposed to capture this theory of pretense imagination. And the idea is that once we have this logical framework, we can sort of very clearly see what's going on and what the different kinds of operations are. Um, and then we'll use that to then uh, give a sort of argument by cases for the epistemological value of what I've been calling pretense imagination. So that's roughly the plan for today. So as I said, um, pretense imagination. So I started approaching this topic from also working on uh, a little bit on what pretense is. And um, we have this famous example of young children uh, with two empty cups in front of them. And then they pretend to be at a tea party and they pour, pretend to pour tea in one of the cups or in both cups, sorry. Um, and then one of the two cups is being held upside down. And then the experimenters will ask, so which of the two cups is full? And they will consistently point to the cup that sort of wasn't turned upside down, even though, of course, both cups are actually empty. So this is an instance of pretense, uh, which is very interestingly because children seem to behave sort of relatively rational, um, even though it goes against their beliefs about what the actual world is like. Uh, so this is why, uh, and then I wanted to focus on the kind of imagination that plays a role in these kinds of situations. So that's why I started to call it pretense imagination. Um, but I think it's probably sort of better to demarcate it as just sort of the simulated rational belief revision part of what people take recreative imagination to be, right? So whenever people talk about imagination as this offline capacity or the simulating capacity, I'm just focusing on the um, rational belief revision part of that capacity. Um, and there are some uh, sources here of people who think more or less, or at some part, uh, take imagination to at least involve something like this. Um, good, so a couple of features which I think are important for pretense imagination is that first of all, it 
involves a form or it is a form of reality oriented imagination right so in the pretend tea uh, pretend tea party when you turn the cup upside down the, the child or i take it that when you're engaging in that pretense you will imagine the tea falling down instead of falling upwards uh, so in this sense it's sort of restricted by what you take uh, the causal laws of the actual world to be if you will um, secondly the kind of imagination or the kind of pretense imagination that I focus on is strictly propositional imagination. So it's imagining that there is tea in the cup as opposed to imagining a cup or imagining what the tea would taste like, right? And this is where um, sort of talking about pretense might be a bit confusing because I'm not denying that there's more to pretense than just propositional imagining, right? So I'm just focusing on the propositional imagining aspect of it. Um, then this kind of pretense imagination is supposed to have an explicit starting point. So this is taken from Langland Hassan's work, um, which can either be very explicit. So it could be something like, let's now pretend that we're at this tea party, uh, but it might also be more subtle. So it might also be something like you're looking up at the sky and you see a plane pass by, and then you start to imagine uh, that you are a fighter pilot or something. So a crucial feature um, is what's been called quarantining which uh, nowadays has a whole different connotation, of course. Um, but in terms of pretense imagination, the idea is that pretense imagination is supposed to not affect the actual belief that you have, right? So I can pretend stuff that I believe not to actually be the case, and not everything that I believe to actually be the case will play a role in pretense. So the sort of the imagination and the belief are quarantined from each other. Although we'll see that there is an interesting relation between the two. Um, and then within the pretense, the agent sort of behaves rationally. What I mean by that is more that the agents would sort of take in, respond to sort of incoming information as they would in real life. Uh, and this is where sort of it has the same kind of update mechanisms for their pretend beliefs as they would have for their sort of actual beliefs. Um, and then finally, uh, as Nicholson Stitch point out, pretense is full of choices that are not dictated by the pretense premise, right? So ultimately there's gotta be some variation uh, in the imagined scenario as from, from when you would sort of purely update your beliefs with uh, being at a tea party because these agents can sort of actively intervene in the pretense with additional uh, contents. Now, um, as I said, this is where sort of uh, thinking about it in terms of pretense might be a bit misleading because of course in actual pretense there's also this sort of uh, action aspect in it where you engage with props and where you engage with the environment there might also be sort of sensory imagination going on um, but again i'm just trying to focus on that hypothetical belief revision aspect of pretense so um just some very quick motivations of why you might look at this kind of uh, imagination. So first of all, it does do kind of a good job of modeling the development of these pretend situations. So in other work with my colleague, Ibuka Uzgun, we've tried to develop a sort of logical model where we try to model the development of such pretend play uh, over time. And looking at imagination as hypothetical belief revision seems to do quite a good job. Um, this kind of imagination also seems to be able to deal with two puzzles about the imagination. So the puzzle of imaginative use and the up to us challenge. Uh, I won't go into this, how it exactly works, but um, it's in line with what Baldrock Jackson has argued about recreative imagination in general. Um, and then the main motivation why I'm interested in this kind of imagination is that people have been recently uh, have been arguing that this kind of imagination is epistemically useful. And what I mean by being epistemically useful is that it can provide some form of justification for gaining new beliefs, right? So Langland Hassan in his 2016 chapter in the book uh, edited by Amy Kine and Peter Kung concludes his chapter by saying that the inferences drawn in imagination are then imported back into one's beliefs as the consequence to newly believed conditionals. Uh, so the rough idea is that this kind of hypothetical belief revision um, can provide us with justification for the beliefs in conditionals, 
Uh, and not only Peter Langland Hassan uh, argues this, but Timothy Williamson, of course, also argues this. So sort of throughout his work, that's already uh, prominent, I take it, but more recently in his most recent book, Suppose and Tell, it's a sort of very explicit that Williamson takes this kind of approach to justify our beliefs and conditionals. Um, so let's go over a very, what's supposed to be a very general or abstract theory of pretend imagination. Uh, again, I'm leaning on Peter Langland Hassan's work here, because as he points out in this chapter, uh, he describes there a theory of this pretense imagination that's supposed to be so general that most people who work on this should agree with. So he points out that he himself and Nicholson Stitch, for example, disagree a lot on the details of what pretense imagination or pretense is supposed to be. But he suggests that both of them uh, should be able to find, sort of agree on this very abstract level of description of what pretense is. So I'll just follow um, his theory very roughly. And the idea is that this kind of imagination um, we can consider as an imaginative episode. And the imaginative episode is then build up sort of smaller individual imaginative stages. Right? So when we think back to the pretend tea party example, the whole pretend uh, play was, uh, would be an imaginative episode. And then for example, imagining that the tea is being poured, imagining that the cup is being picked up, et cetera, et cetera, would all be sort of imaginative stages that collectively make up the imaginative episode. And what's crucial is that uh, Langlan Hassan argues that this kind of imagination always starts with an explicit input. So an explicit input proposition, uh, which he argues is a particular intention of the agent to start this imaginative episode. Then once we have such an input, um, the, when it's left to its own devices, the imagination sort of develops as it would um, sort of when the input was provided and uh, we would just rely on our rational belief revision policies, right? So this is what Langland Hassan calls the lateral constraints, where he thinks that imagination develops by the same kinds of mechanisms um, as would sort of belief revision. I call this the internal development, which is the development of an imaginative episode that's governed by those same mechanisms as uh, that guide inferences in rational belief updates. And so this is really the core sort of hypothetical belief revision part of pretense imagination. But then of course, in order to account for uh, the variations that might occur in pretense or in imagination, we need to be able to account for uh, why this happens. So why it's not the case that when you update with a particular proposition, you would always get the exact same result. And this is because uh, what Peter Langland Hassan calls cyclical interventions. So agents can sort of actively intervene other kind of propositional contents that would then slightly uh, vary the updates that are being made. And this then accounts for the kind of variations that might occur in uh, pretense imagination, right? So the idea is that we forcefully add propositional content that wouldn't necessarily follow from your pretend beliefs at that particular point. And um, sort of we don't need to worry here about the sort of phenomenological aspect of pretense play because as Langdon Hassan notes, this kind of choices or intervening uh, are likely to happen sub or unconsciously. So we don't need to sort of worry that it doesn't feel like uh, that we're making choices all the time. Okay, so this is very roughly the kind of general framework or skeleton of a framework of pretense imagination that I'm now gonna try to come up with uh, a formal model with. So um, I apologize that this late in the afternoon, we have to go through logic um, and it's hard enough as it is to sort of follow formalisms on slides. So wherever I could, I've tried to come up with sort of pictorial representations of the models and the formalisms in the hope that it sort of makes things a bit clearer uh, and less tedious. Um, good. So what we're trying to model with these models, so this is a sort of a simplified version of the work uh, that I've done with Ibuka. What we're trying to do is sort of explain how we get from one imaginative stage to the next in order to explain how an imaginative episode develops over time. Right? So these are processes that happen over time. Uh, so the first thing we need is a branching time frame. 
So this is a model that allows us to sort of track changes of time. Um, and then we're going to sort of map onto this the belief revision part, which we'll come to next. So first, the branching time frames. These are just a, a collection of times. And because we're going to use these times to model imaginative stages, I've called them uh, a set of stages and a binary relation between them. And the binary relation between them has to satisfy these two conditions, um, namely that there's no branching in the past, so we only branch upwards in the future, uh, and that it's a strictly next time relation, meaning that we don't end up with sort of circles in time. Um, so this means that we have this sort of tree growing upwards from a single node, and then um, we can construct histories on such a branching time frame uh, as a particular path through one of these branching time frames. Right? So a history is just a collection of nodes such that each one just follows the next one. Um, and then we call the first stage the initial states and the one that we're currently at we're calling the current stage. So here's a pictorial representation of this. Um, we just have branching in the future and no circles. So this is just uh, an example of a particularly small branching time model. And then given this model, we could have this as a particular history. So the history would just be the collection of S0, S13, and S22 as a particular path through the branching time frame. So we use these kinds of branching time models to um, model the development over time. Now we need um, a way to model this hypothetical belief revision part. So in order to do this, we look at um, dynamic epistemic logic. And in dynamic epistemic logic, belief and belief revision are often modeled by use of plausibility models. So the idea is sort of very intuitive that we have this set of all possibilities or all these possible worlds. Um, and for any particular agent, these worlds are going to be ordered um, based on the plausibility of we, what we take the world to be like. Right? So given the information that I have, there are certain situations that are ruled out of being the actual world because my evidence rules them out. There are other worlds that sort of uh, are ruled in as candidates for being the actual world. And then among these candidates for what the actual world is like, there's this plausibility ordering just on what I take to be more plausible than what not. Um, so we represent this ordering with this um, sort of symbol here. And for those of you who are interested, this is a total pre-order, which just means that there's always sort of, we can always compare two worlds for similar or for plausibility. Um, now, so for simplicity's sake, we work with a finite set of worlds. Um, we don't have to, and we can still construct what I'm gonna say next, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just assume that there's this finite set of possible worlds, which means that we can always find the set of most plausible worlds. Right? So for a particular agent, there's always going to be this set of worlds which the agent takes to be the most plausible worlds. Um, so these are the set of worlds that, compared to any other world, they're either equally possible or more possible, plausible than the worlds for comparison. So we define this by this minimum set as the set of most plausible worlds. And now very roughly what we're going to do is we're just going to take these plausibility orderings and map them on to each of the stages in the branching time model, right? So this looks as follows, that at each stage at, uh, of the branching time model, we have different plausibility orderings. And sort of the very rough idea is that um, what an agent does when they're engaging with pretense imagination is that they hypothetically update their beliefs. And each time you update your beliefs, you get a different plausibility ordering. So, by this way, we can model or track the sort of the development of their pretend beliefs throughout time. And then we'll construct a way to sort of abstract or uh, extract from this the kind of imaginative episode that gave rise to this development of their pretense beliefs. Okay, so now that we have these different plausibility models on the nodes through time, of course, um, the sort of most pressing question is. How do agents get from one plausibility model uh, to the next one at the different stage? Um, so there's different ways of doing this. And uh, we can talk about the Q&A if people want about the different ways of doing this. But the most straightforward, most straightforward way of doing so is by the lexicographic upgrade. 
So the lexicographic upgrade is just a strategy for how to revise your beliefs uh, when getting incoming information. Um, this is the very sort of complete definition of what it's like, but there's a more intuitive way definition of what it does. So say that you have a plausibility ordering on the set of worlds and you have to update your beliefs with proposition P. So you accept proposition P as incoming, uh, but this means that you sort of have to accommodate certain other kinds of beliefs, uh, which results in a new plausibility ordering, right? So there's different ways of doing this accommodating stuff. And the lexicographic upgrade says that roughly what you do is you sort of take all the worlds in which P is true and you make them strictly more plausible than all the non-P worlds, right? But then within the ordering uh, or with sort of within the set of all the P worlds, you don't touch the ordering. So really it leaves all the orderings uh, as they are, they just take all the, most, the P worlds and make them strictly more plausible than the non-P worlds. Um, so this means that we can now, we now have a way of describing how agents sort of get from one stage to the next, namely by uh, performing this lexical graphic upgrade with a particular proposition. Um, and the way that we represent this is saying that sort of the plausibility ordering at stage 12, for example, is the plausibility ordering of state zero updated with uh, phi two in this case, right? And so depending on with what kind of proposition you update your beliefs, you get different new plausibility orders. Okay. Um, so we now have everything to define our semantics. And once we have the semantics for our imagination operator, we can then extract uh, the imaginative episode. So we're almost done with the formalisms part. So um, we have a very straightforward language of propositional logic, uh, and we just add a belief operator and an imagination operator. And then we evaluate the um, truth value of sentences at a world and a history. So we look at an entire history to evaluate sentences. Now for the propositional cases, it's all very straightforward. Um, it's just sort of the standard valuation. And it's actually also very straightforward to prove that for propositional sentences, their truth value doesn't change throughout the model, right? Because the only thing that changes at the different stages is the plausibility ordering, um, but this only has an effect on the epistemic sentences, not on the ontic sentences, because we don't change the model of the world. Okay, so these propositional cases uh, will have the same truth, truth value throughout the model. Um, so this is where we look at the more interesting stuff. So the pretend belief operator and the pretend belief operator just looks at the plausibility ordering at the current stage of a history. So we have a particular history and at the current stage of where we're at, we look at the set of most plausible worlds. And if a sentence is true at all those plausible, most plausible worlds, then the agent is set to pretend to believe that phi. Right, so this is really just the standard definition of how belief works on plausibility models, uh, but then at a particular stage. Um, so that's the belief operator or the pretend belief operator, which is still relatively straightforward. Um, and now we look at the imagination operator, which does this kind of cool thing that if we have a uh, history on our branching time model, the imagination operator is sort of a backwards looking modality. So it says that at a particular stage, you imagine something if somewhere before you have used that proposition to update your pretend beliefs. Okay, I'll, sh I'll give an example of this again on the model uh, in a second. The one thing I wanted to stress here is that um, the belief and imagination operator only range over Booleans, meaning that we don't have embedded belief or imagination operators uh, in belief and imagination operators. Right, so we don't allow for pretending to believe that we pretend to believe that we imagine something. Uh, and the reason why we rule this out has one to do with sort of simplicity and uh, secondly with worries about triviality results because we're gonna, talk, gonna be talking about conditionals in a second. And as soon as you allow for embedded belief operators, there are worries about the triviality results which we wanna avoid. So an uh, example of the imagination operator. So let's take the red uh, path to be our current history. And then we wanna check at the current stage 
So at uh, plausibility model 22, plausibility ordering 22, um, if we've imagined phi. So what the truth conditions say is that it's true at this stage that you imagine phi if you used phi either to get from 0 to 13 or you used phi to get from 13 to 22. Right? So very roughly in terms of the imaginative stages and the imaginative episodes, if you used phi to get from one imaginative state to another, then we say that in the imaginative episode, you've imagined phi. Um, now, what the cool thing is, is that we can now sort of use this to track how the development of the pretend situation episode uh, developed by checking all the individual propositions that were used to move from one stage to the next. And then we sort of take these uh, as a collection to describe the pretense or the imaginative episode as a whole, right? So let's say that we used uh, proposition phi three for our first imagine to get to our first imaginative stage and we used phi five to get to our second imaginative stage. Then we'll say that the imaginative episode consists of propositions phi three and phi five. Right? so it's the collection of propositions that we use to get from one stage to the next. And this we can then use to describe uh, imaginative episodes and also how they developed over time. So one final thing uh, is that we wanna capture this distinction between the internal development that we talked about before and the intervened content that we talked about before. And the way that we can accommodate this is by introducing two distinct operators for this. Um, and sort of the rough gloss of it is as follows. It says that um, with the subscript I is for the internally developed uh, imagination. And remember this was just when sort of imagination was left to its own devices and it just relies on sort of hypothetical believer vision updates. So we say that something was part of the internal development if you just use the stuff that you pretend to believe at the stage before. So if I just sort of update my beliefs with whatever I believe at the pretense at that point in time, that's just sort of imagination being left to its own devices. And then something is explicitly added if uh, you update your beliefs, your pretend beliefs with it, but you didn't pretend to believe it, right? So for example, I'm in the pretend tea party, then uh, if I believe there that there's tea in the pot, I can sort of use this to further the imaginative episode. And this would just be an instance of the internal development. But I might, for example, sort of explicitly add that there's a butler now coming in, which sort of wouldn't necessarily follow from anything that I would believe beforehand, but I can sort of actively choose to then add this and update my pretend beliefs with this. Okay, good. So with all of this out of the way, I'm now gonna use this sort of model to argue that um, this kind of pretense imagination cannot play a significant role in the epistemology of possibility. And um, the sort of the target claims are at least people like Peter Langland Hassan and Timothy Williamson, uh, perhaps also Franz Berto sometimes talks about um, the epistemological value of imagination in terms like these. Um, and they argue that this kind of imagination might be central to conditional reasoning and the epistemology of conditionals. And then what I'm interested in, what Langland Hassan uh, doesn't really seem to be interested in, but for example, Williamson does, is the particular use of those conditionals in an epistemology of possibility, right? So this means that we need to sort of evaluate the following two claims. First of all, can pretense imagination provide justification in believing conditionals? Uh, and if so, can it in virtue of those conditionals play a role in the epistemology of possibility, right? And sort of to spoil things, I'm gonna argue that one is gonna be true, uh, but two turns out to be false. Good. Um, so you might note that our semantics that we've talked about doesn't have this sort of indicative conditional in our language. So you might wonder, how can we use the model you, you've just given us to evaluate this claim that pretense imagination uh, can play a role in the epistemology of uh, conditionals? So I'm very quickly gonna argue that we do have everything we need. Um, and the reason is that 
we can sort of rely on the relationship between beliefs and conditionals and conditional beliefs, right? So this is a very venerable tradition in the epistemology of conditionals, the sort of Ramsey test epistemology, where we say something that to determine whether or not we should accept a conditional, uh, we should hypothetically add the antecedent to our beliefs, uh, update our beliefs with it, and then check whether or not we accept the, uh, the consequent. So Ramsey said this in a footnote, but then also people like Stolnaker and Timothy Williamson seem to suggest epistemologies of conditionals in this kind. Um, now, and this is also one of the reasons why we don't allow for embedded imaginings, uh, because we can safely assume that beliefs in conditionals and conditional beliefs are related to each other uh, without worries of triviality if we don't allow for this embedding of beliefs, right? And we do have everything in our model to define a conditional belief. So we just say that uh, a conditional belief is true if uh, the consequent is true at the set of the most plausible worlds after having updated it with the antecedent, right? So uh, the agent believes psi given or conditional on phi. Uh, and this then epistemologically speaking will be enough um, to evaluate whether or not we have beliefs in conditionals, right? So we don't even need the stronger logical equivalence between these two claims. We just sort of need the rough epistemological equivalence. So as long as something like the Ramsey test is the right uh, epistemology for conditionals, then we have everything we need. Um, and there's more to say about, there's been a lot of sort of empirical literature sort of supporting this claim uh, in the sort of the new paradigm of psychological, the psychology of reasoning. But um, given the time, I won't go into this now. So then, um, Given this, we have everything we need to uh, sort of evaluate these claims. And these are two very explicit mentions of it that the rough idea is that the use of pretense imagination is that once you sort of start your imaginative episode with phi and you develop it uh, a little bit further, if you then come to believe that psi at some point in the imagination, then you are justified to incorporate if phi then psi into your actual beliefs. Right, so there is this feature of quarantining, but the sort of the justificatory role of pretense imagination is supposed to be that if you end up believing psi or pretending to believe psi given phi, then in your actual beliefs, you're allowed to incorporate if phi then psi. Right, and this is what Williamson and Langland Hassan both seem to suggest. So given that we have the um, sort of internal development of the imagination and the uh, intervened content of the imagination, we can now argue by cases to check which of these two aspects play the sort of the justificatory role here. So either conditionals can be justified through the internal development or conditionals can be justified through imagination based on added content. And um, I will very quickly argue that one is in fact false. Uh, and two is true. So two uh, kind of conditionals based on imagination with added content are the kinds of conditionals that uh, we can gain justification for. But then I'm gonna argue that these are not the kinds of conditionals that can play a role in the epistemology of possibility, which is what I'm ultimately interested in. Um, so I'm gonna do this relatively quick because of time issues. Um, and then if people have questions, we can go back to it um, in the Q and A perhaps. But the way that I'm gonna argue against the first claim that conditionals can be justified through imagination based on the internal development is to define what I call an internally developed history. And we look at a history which only uses updates that are internal developments of imagination. Um, and then, so the claim is that if you do this and you come to have a conditional belief at a certain stage, then you didn't have this conditional belief at the root stage because it's supposed to be this new conditional that you gain justification for. Um, but I argue that it's false. So you can prove in the system that I've given you that in fact for all internally developed uh, histories, um, if anywhere in that internally developed history you get this conditional belief, you've had this conditional belief at each stage at the internally developed history. Um, so also at the root stage which means that it's not a new conditional belief. Um, and it follows from our belief revision policy, which I will skip over for now. Um, 
So this sort of shows that, or at least suggests, given the hand wavy proof that I've just talked about, that uh, the first claim has to be false, right? So that it cannot be the internally developed uh, imagination that provides us with justification for conditionals. Now note that this is not a very surprising uh, sort of conclusion, and it's not that people are actually claiming this, because uh, as Williamson in his recent book sort of very explicitly points out, we usually rely on conditionals when in fact we don't know the antecedent of the condition. And so this is what Williamson calls uh, the prospective use of conditionals. We need if A then C most when we don't know that A. Right? So we should uh, all along already of course have focused on conditionals where we forcefully add something that we didn't believe to begin with. Um, so my proof was just sort of to strengthen this. Um, and here's a model that shows that this does actually work. So we can construct models in which we do end up with a conditional belief somewhere in the history, um, and we didn't have the conditional belief at the root stage. So the fact that we're able to construct these models shows that we can in fact use pretense imagination to justify new uh, conditional beliefs and thus beliefs in new conditionals. So this seems to support the claim that uh, we can use pretense imagination to provide justification for believing conditionals, namely those conditionals where we started with intervened content. Right? So the first of the two claims that we needed to evaluate seems to come out true. So the second question then, uh, and the question that I'm most interested in is, can we then use pretense imagination in virtue of the fact that it can provide justification for conditionals, um, can we use it to gain knowledge of possibility claims? Um, and the question really becomes that uh, fo we focus on conditionals of which we do not yet know whether the antecedent is true, right? So that's what we've shown before. If we do believe the antecedent to be true, we don't get any new information from this. Um, I should point out that what I'm gonna focus on next is slightly a slightly different interpretation or a slightly different focus on, for example, Williamson's use of conditionals. So when you look at Williamson's views in the philosophy of philosophy, he mostly relies on conditionals sort of as definitions for modal claims, right? So he always talks about um, if, a, if it's possible that A then, and then there's some sort of definition that uh, defines the possibility claim. Uh, Dominic Gregory, has written a very nice article showing that this doesn't really work, or at least that it cannot play a role in the epistemology of possibility. So what I'm gonna focus on is a slightly different use that Williamson makes of conditionals, namely in his analysis of thought experiments. So in his analysis of thought experiments, he says that if we have a justified belief in a conditional, um, then we can also come to know the possibility of the conclusion, right? So he talks about get your cases, and he says what the get your case shows is that if a get your situation is true, then there is just a uh, justified true belief, but not knowledge. Uh, and then we use these kinds of conditionals to gain a knowledge of the possibility that justified true beliefs aren't, uh, are possible without knowledge. So I'm gonna focus on the use of this kind of conditionals where we sort of rely on this transfer of possibility. So given that we focus on conditionals uh, of which we don't, believe the antecedent to be true, or at least of which we don't know yet whether the antecedent is true, there seem to be sort of roughly two options uh, concerning the modal status of the antecedents of the conditionals. Right? So either the antecedent is merely false in that it's false in the actual world, but it's true in other possible worlds, or the antecedent is necessarily false. So it's impossible that it ever will be true. Now, this difference is gonna turn out to be crucial for the kind of reliance of uh, conditionals in the epistemology of possibility, right? So consider the following two conditionals. If Amy squared the circle, she becomes a famous logician. Uh, and if Lemia works in her office, she's sitting in a nice chair. Now assume for the sake of the argument that uh, we are justifiably believing both conditionals to be true on the basis of our uh, pretense imagination we also believe both of the antecedents to be false, but we have no idea about the modal status of these antecedents, right? So we don't know whether they're merely false or whether they're necessarily false. Now for Williamson then to sort of, uh, or sorry, 
for any sort of conditional based epistemology of possibility, if we want to become justified in uh, believing that Amy becomes a famous logician, um, or believing that it's possible that she becomes a famous logician based on this uh, conditional, these conditionals are of no use to us, un uh, sorry, unless we know the modal status of the antecedent, right? So unless we know whether or not it's merely false or necessarily false that Amy squared the circle, uh, then we can use these conditionals to come to know that it's possible that she becomes a famous logician. Um, so, but then of course, the moral of the story now is that if we wanna use the conditionals um, that we can gain justification for through pretense imagination to gain knowledge of possibilities, we need prior modal knowledge, right? We need modal knowledge of the status of the antecedent. And as many people have argued, such as Bob Hill and Sonia Lecoroyes, uh, the reliance of such unexplained prior modal knowledge severely undercuts the prospects of the proposed epistemology of modality. Um, I'll wrap up very quickly. Um, so Williamson seems to suggest that something like pretense imagination is crucial for his conditional based epistemology of modality. I say something like, because this is where I think uh, Williamson is not very clear on what he takes imagination to be. Um, so my conclusion is then also very modest in that either Williamson thinks that there is some form of pretense imagination going on, in which case his theory does rely on prior modal knowledge, or he has to tell us what he does think that imagination is, and it cannot be anything like pretense imagination. Um, however, I do think that what my argument shows is that we do get knowledge of uh, these conditionals through pretense imagination. So if we do have knowledge of the um, modal status of the antecedent, we can use this kind of imagination as sort of an extending rule of our modal knowledge. <clears throat> and this is very much in line with what Dominic Gregory argued in this paper where he argues against the, this slightly more different use of um, conditionals in Williamson's work when he concludes that uh, while the described method may well produce beliefs about possibility that tend to be right, our justification for holding that it does uh, depends on our being entitled to assume the customary possibility of the propositions that serve as starting points of the applications of the relevant process. And um, my arguments are in a similar vein, or my conclusions are in a similar vein as Gregory's. Um, so pretense imagination might play a role in providing justification for believing conditionals, namely when we rely on added content and then develop that kind of supposition, uh, but it cannot in virtue of one play a role in the epistemology of possibility. So uh, to conclude, note that this is a very modest conclusion. Um, there are sort of not that many people who sort of explicitly think that rational believer vision uh, play a role in the epistemology of possibility. Although Williamson in his more recent book does sort of come very close to this. Um, but I take it that for everyone who claims that recreative imagination plays a role in possibility, in the epistemology of possibility, uh, and there are quite a few people who do this. So people who sort of claim that imagination is this offline capacity or the simulating capacity. Um, if that kind of imagination is to play a role in the epistemology of possibility, which I ultimately think that it does, uh, it can at least not be through the simulated belief revision. We always need some sort of other kind of input. Uh, and I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs>